On the 30th of June, 2019, a man fell from the sky. A stowaway fell a kilometer through the air before landing in the back garden of a house in Clapham. It's such a surreal thing to think of a dead body falling from a plane. The body just missed a tenant reading a book on a sun lounger. They could hear uh, the sound of that impact from a few doors away. Nobody knows who this man was or why he decided to risk his life to make it to the UK. But I was determined to get to the bottom of this tragic story and find out who the stowaway really was. Police are investigating the death of a suspected stowaway who fell from a plane's landing gear as it approached Heathrow Airport. About the man, no, we know neither his name nor where he came from. We've gone from London to East Africa to identify the man who fell from the sky. We went to Offerton Road to find out what happened on that fateful day. The tenant, who was nearly hit by the stowaway, didn't want to speak, but the neighbours shared their reflections. First, it was just strange, you know, it's such a surreal thing to think of a dead body falling from a plane. People were quite concerned about the fact that this poor man had actually done something quite as dangerous as this. Well, here we are, living our very affluent uh, lifestyles in a very wealthy country. And people are obviously drawn towards a country like this. They see the opportunities maybe that we don't see. Either he's been deceived or he's very desperate because it's such a risky thing to do. So that person must have been in an incredibly desperate state. With money and the proper papers, you can fly from Nairobi to London at 9.30 every morning. But the stowaway had neither of these. Instead, he'd hidden in the wheel bay of a London-bound jet. At the time, airport officials told us the identity of the stowaway was a mystery, adding, no one from the airport's gone missing. So we decided to investigate ourselves. The flight left Nairobi on the 30th of June and flew to 37,000 feet. At that altitude, temperatures dropped to minus 60 or more. On its London approach, the jet dropped to 3,500 feet, and the wheels were lowered for landing. Jumbo. We began to look for a name at Nairobi's Jomo Kenyatta International, on the assumption the stowaway had probably worked uh, here. Where exactly you want to go? We tried exporters and agents who send fruit and flowers to the UK. We're not getting anywhere here. It took a couple of days, but we finally got a break. We got a tip from a taxi driver called Kamal. He told us a cleaner from a company called Colnet had gone missing at the end of June. He picked the information up from a couple of airport employees. Companies like Colnet supply hundreds of cleaners at the airport. They also provide a bus service in the morning, but the perks end there for airport workers. Cleaners working for Colnet earn around two pounds a day and there's no job security. It seems some employees need additional support. One worker preached from the Bible at the front of the Colnet bus. We started speaking to people that work for Colnet and found a woman called Irene. She asked us to protect her identity. She told us that her colleague named Paul Manyasi went missing at the end of June. We were at work in the morning. So he suddenly disappeared. Nobody knows where he went. I called his phone. It was off. The following day, the supervisor called us and told us there's somebody missing. But we are not sure of the person. So we keep it a secret until we know the person. It turns out that Irene and Paul were in a relationship. They'd been together for two years and were planning on starting a family. I just feel like I've lost someone I loved so much. She showed us some pictures of Paul and told us a bit more about him. He was 29 years old and lived in a slum close to the airport. It's better known as Makuru Kwajenga. It's the only place most airport workers can afford. 
Paul Mignassi lived here because it's close to the airport and it's relatively cheap. It's also huge, more than half a million people living in a couple of square miles. And it won't be easy to find his room. He lived with a fellow cleaner called Patrick and we spent several days trying to find him in this overcrowded, mud-strewn spot. We found Patrick's room in a rectangular shack, but no one answered the door. His neighbor said he'd moved out a few weeks ago. However, we got a number from a contact and a meeting was arranged after dark. Patrick used to work at Colnet and he wrangled Paul a job there too. He didn't want to reveal his identity. Paul was a friend of mine. We come from the same county. We went to the same school. But Patrick says they both dreamed mm. of a better life. There was a job somewhere he was seeking. Um, it was not in Kenya, by the way. So Paul Manyasi was looking for a new life overseas, and he disappeared on the same day the stowaway boarded the flight to London. But Patrick wasn't sure it was him. Do you think Paul Manyasi was the stowaway? I cannot know, but I cannot know if he flied. You're not sure? I don't know. Patrick wasn't certain, and neither were we. So we asked the Metropolitan Police if there was anything they could share. They responded with this. It's an e-fit picture of the victim and some images of his things. Basically, this is a computerized mock-up, a guess of what the police think the stowaway looked like before he fell out of the plane. They've also provided some pictures of the clothing he was wearing and some images of the personal effects he left in the landing bay of the aircraft. And I think this is a big deal. We need to take these images back to Kenya and see what people think. We went back to meet Paul Manyasi's girlfriend, Irene, who'd left Nairobi for the family plot in rural Kenya. We found her on the outskirts of the nearest town. There she is. There's Irene. She agreed to look at the police photographs, an opportunity, she said, to be sure. I began by showing her the EFIT picture. Does that look like Paul to you? They look alike, but he wasn't dark. He was not dark, but the face resembles. How about this bag? Yeah, he bagged Niake. And it was written somewhere. It must be written somewhere here. MCA or something. MCA was written on the bag. Okay, because I've got something else to show you. You can take that. Yeah, MCA somewhere. That's his bag? Yeah. Okay. What, what does it stand for? Member of County Assembly. Member of County Assembly? Yeah. yeah. Why, why would he have that on his bag? He liked to be called that name, like a nickname. Like a nick that was his nickname, MCA? Member of County Assembly. It's a bit like calling yourself MP or Honourable. Do you think Paul Manyasi is the stowaway? Yeah. You do? According to these pictures. You're, you're sure, are you? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, Irene. Irene doesn't understand it. Maybe Paul acted on impulse, she says. Yet 
Paul Mignassi's fate was sealed when he lodged himself underneath a long-haul Boeing 787. We spoke to aviation expert Guy Leach in the wheel bay of a Boeing 747. You can imagine a stowaway could get up through the gear legs, get in through that crack that would be about this high there, and climb along the spar, the lower spar, and stand in that corner there. And he'd probably think to himself, made it, I'm, I'm safe, okay, I've done it, okay. And then, of course, the aircraft takes off and the noise uh, from the engines, it must be absolutely terrifying. Terrifying, but not unprecedented. A small number have hidden themselves on aircraft destined for Britain, but over the past 15 years, only two are thought to have survived. It's something of a miracle, says Leach. 33,000 feet would be an initial cruising altitude. Life is not sustainable without oxygen at that level. Um, and in fact, at that level, your body is actually pumping its oxygen back out into the air. So even if you manage to somehow breathe, you've got to survive the cold. And this is a cold far colder than any cold storage. This is 10 hours of being absolutely deep frozen. There was one more stop we had to make in an impoverished region in Western Kenya. We wanted to meet Paul Manyasi's parents, but we were worried. What if the cleaning company or the police hadn't told them about their son? Yeah. We were greeted, yeah. then welcomed into their modest yeah. mud-walled home. Yeah. This is Isaac, Paul Manyasi's father. Has anybody been in touch with you about no. Paul? Has the cleaning company been in touch? No. Nobody. You have no information. No information. Have you been worried about him? Yes, of course. Yeah. Paul's mother is called Janet. Have you tried to contact anybody about Paul? A picture, it is a, an approximation. We showed them the photos from the Met Police, and we asked if they recognized any of the stowaways' things. He used to have it. He used to have this one. He used to have that? Yes. yes. This one. Okay. He used to have this one. You recognize that, do you? Yeah, this one. Okay. This one. okay. The shoes. Okay. The bag, the shoes, a pair of underwear. Yeah. Those were Paul's, they said. It was clear their son had fallen from the airliner. I'm so sorry to to come here to to tell you this. Um, but we felt that you should know. Um, so I'm, I apologize. I'm, I'm very sorry for your loss. What would you like to happen now? Isaac and Janet are desperately poor. They cannot afford to say goodbye, but they deserve to know what happened to their eldest son. Paul's mother, Janet, said a prayer as we left, and they quietly and politely thanked us for coming. And we didn't expect that. I mean, their resilience was extraordinary. It was re remarkable. We went to the people who run Nairobi's International Airport, the Kenya Airport's authority, and asked them for a response to our findings. We had an appointment with the managing director of the Aviation Authority. That's been cancelled. Apparently he's got to go and see the Minister of Transport. But I think they're worried. I think they're concerned. Do they agree with our conclusions about Paul Manyasi, we asked? Does it represent a serious security breach? They didn't reply. We also went to cleaning company Colnet. Can they confirm the 29-year-old went missing at the end of June? They didn't reply either. He was relatively young at 29 years old. His friends said he was funny and he was ambitious too. But there were too many obstacles in his way. For Paul was a cleaner on two pounds a day, with thousands ready to replace him. We think he took a chance, threw caution to the wind, 
then paid the price in a garden in South London 